image from the view with large gallery i had to go back to normal gallery to see the powerpoint okay i'm i'm seeing the powerpoint now is anybody Wonderful. else seeing it excellent you, i'm just gonna you, you see have if to i click can take control you have now. you've taken control it's allowed yeah. you so that's brilliant brilliant that's fantastic so drum roll please <laughs> the winner for u101 is Kelly Parker for your community allotment prototype. Um, we just love the, as as Gareth said, so many so many great socially and environmentally conscious ideas, and we we really liked the kind of how you'd thought of different aspects of the of uh, the scheme to have a community allotment. Um, let me just try and advance the slide. There we go. That can you see that? This is very lo lovely in the way it's presented. Oh, have they not advanced for everybody? Now they did in the beginning, on, but I think now been. they have. I hope There's probably a lag. Uh, <laughs> possibly a lag due to due to terrible broadband in my my area. But yeah, so Kelly, um, very well done. Um, we do also, we, because it was so hard to make a decision, we have also got a highly commended, and that is Thomas, Thomas Martelli. I don't know if Thomas is here. Um, that is a, a, one, a really nice t-shirt design, which has taken that kind of whole thing of snow sports, but you know, if you look carefully, you can see the hand and the way that it's been abstracted into that mountain range. And it's just very, very nice. Um, we should be on seven now. Yeah, seven. I've OK, seen. we are on seven. I can be lovely see seven. to have we seen Thomas. No. Oh. Is, is I Kelly think... here? I think Kelly or Thomas? Kelly's here, I think, from Kelly's Gibraltar. Is that right? Kelly, would you be brave enough to, to tell us a little bit about why why you came up with the idea, how you came up with the idea for your um, project? Hello? Hello? Hiya. Yeah. Sorry, I just went through to the other room to tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank That's you. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, obviously, some of you know um, I live in Gibraltar. And when I got into doing my research, I'd seen how little um, fresh um, fruit and veg were grown here. It was all imported. Um, and living on a little community where we are now, just recently, there's been an allotment put in place, but, um, oh, sorry, I'm shaking. Um, again, during the research part, when the poll came back, a lot of people didn't know it was there or weren't using it. So I just really wanted to encourage people to actually go and use it and get their children involved with it. So I made the whole package just to get everybody realizing it was there. Yeah, like I said, it was the notice board. And then I made all them little individual um, teddies that came with um, little activity cards. So the children can go there and do different activities there to encourage them to get out and about and grow things um so that's where it, that's where that came from really and that's i really love doing it i love doing it so so this is actually a project that you've taken into the into the real world and yes yeah it. yeah fabulous yeah and that's... the um, lady that runs the community here asked if they could use the board and everything like that still so that's yeah um I leave that with them. <laughs> oh, that is that is really lovely, isn't it, to hear of one that just when a project is not just on paper but actually is being realised. I think that's that's super. Thank you so much, Kelly, for oh, being Thank brave you. enough. <laughs> we, you will get a certificate and a, a oh, prize in due course. <laughs> Thanks. I'll Brilliant. go back and buy it now. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, the next the next one to announce is 
for uh, T217 is actually T217 and T218. We do consider them together because they're very similar work. But the winner happens to come this year from T217. We have had winners in the past, I think, from 218. Um, but the winner this time is Sarah Dowley. Uh, Sarah, are you here? Hello. 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 <laughs> Hello. Hi. Brilliant. That's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, oh. I think um like the other lady, it's it's always a surprise. You never know. You don't realise you're gonna have to come and talk. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We, the, we 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 like to maintain the element of surprise, yes. Sarah. I'm so sorry. We land it on you, but and you don't have to talk if you don't want to but it is just <laughs> lovely to hear about your ideas and your your idea is for um in t217 you have to design something for a, a national park um yeah, that's called right. ditchling beacon yes and actually it, it was it was such a fun project to do because um i got to go out and i went to sort of lots of museums and other sort of parks to see what else was going on and um have a look at what children were playing with and what was engaging and use all that sort of research as inspiration but also the really lovely thing about t217 is looking at all the different materials and uh, processes which i found really interesting so um you know what things could be made of and what we could use so yeah i loved it oh that's fantastic it's i think it the people who do 217 do really enjoy it I think um, yeah <laughs> and you do a lot of for you, anyone you want to run students who's not not there yet you do do a, a lot of drawing and a lot of kind of creative design work don't you but yeah it kind of I, takes I love, it up a notch. um you 101 and I sort of thought oh I hope I hope I'm not going to feel like nothing could compare to that because I loved you <laughs> you 101 so much but it, yeah it just gets better <laughs> oh that's that's yeah. brilliant oh well that's really good so thank you thank you for sharing that thank you so our next next one t317 now i have to say it was so hard to make a decision on t317 that we had a round of voting and almost everybody was selected by one of the, it, I should have said, it was kind of selected by members of the design group. So all of the kind of design academics voted. Um, and on 317, the vote was completely, completely split. So I had to go back again and say, can you put a number on it rather than a star this time around? Having done that, two winners emerged. So we've, we've gone for joint winners on T317. Um, and the first winner is Julia. Oh no, I've got there in the different order. <laughs> well, we'll go for. I've I've given a little bit of a spoiler there. The first winner then is Tamsin. Tamsin Grewa. Um, Well done, Tamsin. This is a really nice app for um, swapping craft materials. And as someone who's got cupboards and cupboards full of craft materials that probably should be better used. I can really appreciate the idea behind this. Are you here, Tamsin, to say anything at all? Hello, yeah, I am. Brilliant. Um, you hear me? <laughs> Thank you, this is very fun. Um, yeah, I don't know, it's, it was a very fun app to work on. I really enjoyed it and I've definitely, it's still in my mind and still in progress to whether I'm gonna continue with it or not. Um, but I really did love it and it kind of, it started because I'm a potter as well so it was very much from like a problem that I was having and wanted to fix so lots of people have related to it in like my research and things so it's been an interesting one to work on thank you oh that that's fantastic and are you is the app are you a are you a computing student or are you have you been doing computing alongside design or um so I'm doing design and innovation and I um am a UX designer um in um. my like for work purposes um but a junior one so just started out so we're still learning um and then uh doing a little bit of code on the side I've done, I've done some bits here and there but i prefer the creative side of it and actually designing oh fantastic and as a very bad potter with a 
rub a um, <laughs> thing on my, <laughs> even on my desk, you know. <laughs> um, I Yes, I appreciate why you might want to uh, swap tools and things. So that's brilliant. Um, thank you, Tamsin. And, and great to hear sort of how people integrate kind of, you know, you bring your passions from life into into your studies and um yeah that's that's always that always makes for really good projects um so our other winner on uh t317 is julia davis julia are you here yeah hi there i'm here oh i'm astounded that i've won <laughs> <laughs> i'm really really pleased um yeah just to say just like everyone else has said, really, really enjoyed the process of uh, of the course and design. Um, in my work life, I work in communications, but I absolutely love designing stuff. I'm always doing stuff on the side. So I designed a mascot for South End Council, working with mm. children and been working on a book. And this is very much related to my personal life because my oldest son has severe autism. And um, clothes have been a long running issue for us from when he was really tiny. Um, yes, yeah, so I looked into making an innovation where clothes were exciting for people with autism, because I think there's always out there for people with disabilities of different natures seem to be designs seem to be a bit dull sometimes. And I really wanted to help bring people's personalities out. Um, but also to create something that would help children to kind of regulate their sort of sensory needs when they're out and about. So yeah, I'm delighted to have uh, yeah, to have won. Really excited. It was so very well thought through, and as someone who understands exactly that issue with clothes, because of I've got an autistic daughter. You you yeah, you'd really thought through every element of of kind of what need what the needs were including chewable cuffs I thought that was great <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so yeah thank you Julia that's that's oh, fantastic that's really... <laughs> thank you super excellent well well done to everybody and to all of the people that are, are dis, uh, displayed on the website um which we're about to launch um yeah well well done and uh, thank you for thank you for entering because it is so it's just so heartwarming to see kind of what happened you know where the teaching that we've done leads and it's yeah it it just makes us all as academics feel it's worthwhile <laughs> not that we didn't but you know it really <laughs> makes makes it better so thank you Oh, thank you so much, Georgie, and absolute congratulations to the winners and um, commendation and, and obviously to everyone. Um, we would now like to officially um, open our online exhibition and I'm going to share my screen and I just walk you through it for a little bit. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a physical exhibition. We had it once and we're thinking about maybe doing one again, um, if you would like that um let me know so maybe you can have like a popular vote <laughs> but uh for now i'm just sharing my screen so da -da! <laughs> we are open um design at open um we have our annual show 2024 and um the show is um at, as always on ou-designshow.org and um we have just a landing page where we introduce our winners and you have seen those just now and we also have individual pages for showing each of your work and um, being very proud of what our students in each stage do and this is very special because in many design schools you would only see the final year um, exhibited but we chose very early on a very different approach we really think that it's it's worth um encouraging and really important to show everyone's work so to get a, a better feel of um, where you come from where you're heading and all the diversity that we've seen 
So these are the U101 design thinking projects. These are our um, exhibition for the second level, T217 and T218. And uh, amazing projects, um, some related to, to the chair, TMA, to the um, um, Ditching Beacon and our 317 project page with um, our wonderful winners um, and amazing other projects. And again, it was so, so difficult to choose. Um, it's It's been really interesting over the years to see students um, growing and um, the work that we see being very related to your own life, to your experiences. And as OU students, you bring such a wealth of um, lived experience that you can build on in your designs and make them really um, special to people who need a bit more attention from the design world. And I think for me, that's, that's the absolute amazing part um, of the OU and for this exhibition to show, you know, design can be for everyone. Um, we also have past shows every year. Um, we have a catalog and this year's catalog has been designed by um, Falasayo and we're going to upload that after, after the show is opened. Um, and contact, if you want to get in contact with us um, for whatever reason, <laughs> let us know if you want to have a physical exhibition <laughs> next year. Um, and um, that's really it. So um, I'm sharing my screen just now. Stop sharing. Um, we have a, um, as promised, um, we have um, Derek Jones with us today. Um, he is one of those who um, is leading the BDES. Uh, BDES is called the Bachelor of Design, our shiny new qualification in design. Um, as mentioned before, you can now um, study design on its own. <laughs> in all this beauty, <laughs> so to say. <laughs> so, um, Derek, would you, I know you've got a few slides um, for us to share. Um, is that right? Do you want to go ahead and, and, and share those slides and introduce our new qualification? No Certainly will, Nick, and I'll try not to be too long because um, I know that there's, there's a couple of really exciting speakers coming up as well. Um, and again, I can just only repeat what a few people have said already. You know, I'm absolutely blown away by some of the work. You know, I go up and down the country. I do speak to other design schools quite regularly. It's part of what we do as academics. And, you know, even U101, some of the work that's presented, it's more mature than some graduates from other design schools. And that's because of your background at the Open University, the experience that you have and that you bring to bear. It's second to none. It really, really, really is. So with that in mind, we are really excited to be able to kind of um, expand what we're offering um, in design. Can everybody see full screen? Is that OK? Is it clear? Cool. Um, so, yeah, this is the brand new qualification. The designation is R63. We do like our letters and numbers and our three letter acronyms at the Open University. So this is R63. It's the Bachelor of Design, the BDES. Um, now, that's actually, believe it or not, that's a new designation. It's not a Bachelor of Arts. It's not a Bachelor of Science. It's actually a Bachelor of Design. So you'll actually get mentioned, especially when you graduate at a graduation ceremony at the Open University. And we're really quite proud that this is actually something that is different. And we intend it to be different. Design at the Open University has been kind of a bit weird and different since 1970, believe it or not. But it also fills another gap. I think Theo mentioned this at the start. You can do our core modules. You want to one. 217 um, and uh, 340, Is that, that's the new designation. Goodness me, 317. Um, you can do those modules with existing pathways like business and computing and so on, but we've never had a pathway that was design design. So that's principally what we're trying to do with this particular qualification is give you the opportunity to be able to do a full 360 credits in design, pure design. So the other credits, the other uh, modules, T190, T290 and T390, they aim to really fill the gap, the kind of practitioner gap. Um, so that's going to give you the opportunity to actually put what you learn in the other modules into practice and develop your practice. Um, and it just gives you more exposure, more experience, more practice at being a designer. And that's what we're hoping comes out at the end of this process. We hope that you might actually continue to realise some of the ideas that we've seen tonight or develop them further or take them into different spaces and different domains. Um, 
The first module that we're going to present, however, is T190. We'll talk a bit more about the BDES maybe in the next few months, in the next few years, as we kind of continue to develop our communications with it. But T190 is the first brand new module, and it's going to launch for the first time this October. Um, so that's the J presentation of this year. If you're already registered at the Open University, you can sign up for this module just now. Or if you're not registered at the Open University, you can sign up and start this module um, as well. And T190 is all about starting your design practice. It takes the idea ideas of U101 and it gives you the chance to develop skills and competencies as a design practitioner, somebody who does design. And it's not about us telling you how to do design, it's us showing you different ways that we've learned how to be designers, different practitioners' methods, different tools, different methods, different ways of approaching design and letting you try them. We're letting you try them on projects, so that's the core, if you like, of T190 is actually doing design projects, quite short design projects in T190. We have six quite interesting and exciting projects. And the more that you do them, the more that you learn about yourself as a designer, the more that you develop your skills. So that's what it is. T190 is, if you like, a, a really solid foundation in design. Um, and that is the new BDES qualification. We have a bit more information. I'll put these links into the text chat so they're actually usable as well. And we've got a bit more information online. I'm not going to say too much more about that. Um, look out, if you're studying at the OU just now, look out for any notices. We'll continue to do some student presentations on the new qualification and on T190 throughout the summer. Um, and in the meantime, as I say, I'll put some links, have a look at some of your YouTube assets, including the new T190 um, identity. Um, yeah. And that's it. I'm not going to say any more because I'm really looking for, I want to hear what other people say um, tonight. There's some more interesting people uh, speaking than me tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Derek. That was really a whistle stop tour <laughs> through this. I'm, 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 I'm very, we are very happy to take more questions later on. Um, Yes, we have um, one more slide. Before we go to this amazing opportunity, uh, I really would like, and Georgie, thanks for reminding me, we had a, a student volunteer. So each year we have volunteers um, from our students uh, on the design qualification who work with us on the um, exhibition. And this year, Greg Manzel, he's done amazing work on the website and social media campaign. And um, we really would like on camera, thank you, Greg, for all your hard work. Unfortunately, Greg couldn't come because um, he has to work like many of you students, you know, work is work, unfortunately. But thank you so much. Amazing work. And if you would like to join us next time on the design exhibition team, email me. <laughs> well done, Greg. OK, so one more thing to say. Um, this is an absolutely amazing opportunity um, to get involved um, with the new qualification. We have an open day. I can't believe we do the first design open day ever. So we have a virtual open day as part of the London Design Festival, and that's going to be on the 19th of September. Um, I think it will be an amazing opportunity if you want to join us. It will be online, so easily to access. Um, um, please email Anne-Marie Barlett. The link is just down there. If you want to get involved, maybe help to um, facilitate some sessions with people who are interested or just come along and listen in. Um, there are many opportunities um, to get involved in. So mark the date, September 19. Um, not too far, actually, in the future. I'm so excited about it. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. It's just like a, a rundown of amazing parts of this opening, but now we come to something which is really, um, I'm so looking forward to it. We have two, yes, two design speakers, and I hand over to Felicario. Please, uh, would you introduce um, and guide us through this part of the evening? Yeah, thank you very much, Nicole. Um, so, I'm Felicario. Um, uh, Metro and design. Um, today, uh, I think the next program, or the next uh, activity we have on the program, we uh, have two amazing speakers who will be talking to us about interesting topics. Uh, they'll be sharing some of um, their experiences you know, uh, with us, and uh, I'm personally looking forward to hear what they have to share with us today. So, uh, the first speaker is uh, Amankwa Anoba Sape, who is um, uh, a program manager at British Council, and uh, she's worked in different areas such as PR, communication, global 
uh, over communication, over development. And um, the interesting part about her is uh, knowing uh, that she owned a brand called uh, The Talking Drum. And that brand uh, developed a game, uh, which uh, which she will be discussing with us today. So I'm looking forward to that. And um, over to you, Amanda. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for having me me today. I'm just going to share my screen and presentation, and then I will run through everything. Um, so bear with me whilst I set that up, please. Please let me know once you can see the screen. Yes. Just... Oh, good. Yes. OK. Please. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, hi, my name's Amankwa. I'm the owner of the brand House of Talking Drums and the inventor of the African proverb game. Um, so, yeah, thank you for having me with me today. Um, I'm just going to, in this presentation, going to run through my inspiration, the brand and the game itself, um, talk about the design process and how it was produced. Um, I'll also talk about some of the marketing tools I've used, um, some of the challenges I faced and some of the next steps for myself and, and the game and the brand, and then end on any questions. Um, so just to set this, you know, the scene, I thought, let me start with a proverb. Um, a long journey starts with the first steps. It's an error train proverb. Um, please feel free to have a think about this throughout the presentation and also feel free to add what you think the proverb means or how you've interpreted it in the chat. Um, and maybe we can come back to it um, uh, uh, when, when the questions come to at the end. Um, I am just going to start with a quick video. Um, just to give you an idea of the game experience. Do you enjoy meaningful conversations? Whether it's with the family, amongst friends, or in a group setting, the African proverb game is for you. Built for play, used as a teaching tool, or for moments of personal self-reflection. House of Talking Drums. The African proverb game has a hundred proverbs from across the continent to discover, dissect, debate, and discuss. Pick a card, roll a dice, and get talking as you interpret meanings and share your experiences. House of Talking Drums. Tell a story, unite a people. So uh, I wanted to start on my inspiration of how this game came about, um, which came about during lockdown. Um, I was spending Christmas with my family and it got to the point of the day where it kind of hit a lull, where we had had our Christmas dinner and had watched a few films. And my sister and I, I don't know from where, but started to talk about African proverbs. Um, and we were Googling, you know, some of the meanings and debating amongst ourselves. And then my uncle kind of jumped in and he's a really big storyteller. Um, and he kind of gave examples of his own personal life and experiences of where he felt these proverbs related and also kind of gave interpretations to it. And, you know, my mum jumped in, my brother jumped in, my nan jumped in and a few others jumped in. And we were kind of there talking for a few hours um, just discussing and googling about the proverbs and I thought oh this is a game you know it's multi-generational it links to our culture we're learning more about it it's bringing us together and it's kind of taken us away from from our phones and our screens um, I'd say another key aspect that I found uh as inspiration were other conversational card games, um, which I generally quite enjoy. Um, and one of them being, you know, the School of, Luck, School of Life as a brand has, you know, a, a game called 100 Questions where you ask people back and forth things. And, um, and I also generally enjoyed watching YouTube videos from the end. So personally, I was inspired and enjoy, you know, convers games that prompt discussion and bring people together and kind of encourage people to look at the deeper meaning 
of life and um, to draw that out of each other in a, a respectful way. And lastly, I would say my heritage was a big inspiration for the African proverb game and House of Talking Drums as a brand because, uh, you know, I'm of Ghanaian descent, um, which is in West Africa, Ghana is in West Africa. And uh, my grandmother growing up would use proverbs as encouragement throughout life. And, you know, sometimes when I was being impatient about a thing, one of her sayings would be, you know, everybody's time um, comes at a different time. Some people's time comes in the morning, other people's time comes in the afternoon, others in other people's time comes in the evening, but their time comes. And just generally a, an appreciation for oral traditions and storytelling across the continent and how proverbs can be woven into everyday life and speech. And, you know, my love for like African literature and the greats like Chinua Achebe uh, some of the reasons how this, you know, game came to be. And I thought, you know, I decided to embark on, embark on this journey and I felt like I had nothing to lose by doing so. Um, so now just going into the brand and the game. So as I mentioned, it started during the pandemic, but I officially launched in 2022 once I had gotten the product out. But during that time, I was... Um, building the brand, developing the game. Um, and I was also working and also doing my master's at SOAS. I did international studies and diplomacy there. And a bit about the brand itself, House of Talking Drums, it, um, you know, it aims to unite people with the rich culture and teachings of the African continent, as I mentioned, but doing this through storytelling and preserving oral traditions um, that are passed down by generation to generation across Africa and its diaspora. The African proverb game itself, so the box game, um, is a game full of traditional guidance of wise words and kind of offers a modern twist on those oral traditions. And it, you know, really prompts meaningful discussion and aims to invite players to, you know, broaden their minds and share memorable experiences um, and consider other perspectives as well. Um, I really think it's a game designed for the family, um, a good conversation starter amongst friends. It can be used as a good um, group teaching tool, um, as well as um, can offer an opportunity for like personal inward reflection. Um, so what I would say is with the game, you get a hundred cards and I might just show you here quickly with me. Um, so this is the game pack with the timer and the dice. But in the game, you get 100 cards um, in the box. Every country on the continent of Africa is represented. So from Comoros to Cape Verde, Nigeria to Algeria, South Africa to Tanzania and everything in between. Um, and the cards themselves have a multifunctional use. Um, there are three ways in which to use the cards. There is discuss and decipher, teach and talk, and meditation and mindfulness. And how you play the game or the core game is um, discuss and decipher. And the dynamics behind that are just as in African tradition, um, the eldest goes first. The eldest goes first, picks a card, as I'm picking here, and um, reads aloud the proverb on the card to the rest of the group. They kind of give their interpretation of the card and what they think the proverb means and they might use personal stories and experiences to illustrate that things in foreign affairs and on the news to to also illustrate that to support that point and then they invite the group to to share their thoughts on what they've said um, and their interpretations and feedback and you might find some people agree with your interpretation of the proverb and others disagree and that kind of really lays the basis of the discussion and you know to add a layer to that conversation there is a conversational dice which I'm just showing here might be a bit small um and there are various uh, various icons on each face which links to pillars of conversation and this kind of prompts a more in-depth discussion um, to help you understand how the proverb can be applicable to everyday life. And some of these pillars, um, as uh, I don't know if you can see the icons on this presentation, the gold hut and the mask and the 
the handhold in the world. Um, they relate to like relationships, community, character, um, responsibilities and self-development. So all the proverbs will be tied to that within your discussion. Um, there is also a timer, two minute timer to like reel in the big storytellers. Um, and there is also a uh, opportunity to play for points um, via a voting system, um, but this is optional. Um, then the last, the other two ways in which the cards could be used, as I mentioned, were teach for talk, which could be a teaching tool. So that's really, you know, bringing the proverb, the cards um, in front of students, encourage them to think and share and discuss what they've gained from the meanings of it and illustrate that in various ways, whether that's writing a story, painting something, creating a song or a dance. And then lastly, meditation and mindfulness, which is an opportunity for self-care. You might use the proverb cards themselves um, to, you know, pin up on your wall, your board, your mirror, your, your, your fridge, for example, and use it as a daily affirmation or, you know, a point of personal reflection every day to encourage you about a situation. So um, going into the design process, um, these really were the first steps and um, the beginning, which was quite exciting and a chance for me to um, prove the concept and then also um, see if it worked and, and what it would take to mark work I should say I don't have a design background myself so it required a lot of research um, so in the ide ideation phase as I mentioned I did a lot of research generally into you know the target audience competitors um, a bit about the brand development and storytelling but I first looked at the elements of the game um, and with these elements I really wanted the game to encourage storytelling and um you know for people to have the opportunity to give but also receive um feedback and i also wanted the game to be about social discovery where people could learn together um you know about the proverbs and what they might mean or what they might gain from it and then also somewhat simultaneously strengthen their relationships and social networks um I also felt I didn't want the game to be right or wrong, you know, um, so it was to be customizable. So every game could look different depending on who you're playing with. Um, and no game would be the same, even if you were playing with the same people or picked up the same card, unless you said exactly the same answer, which, you know, given life wouldn't necessarily be the case. And um, I did add a last minute time pressure element with a timer, again, to reel in the big talkers. Um, I then thought about the components of the game. Um, and I really wanted them to add value to the conversation. And um, I wanted them to be optional, um, except for the cards themselves. Um, so that it could offer a bit more of a simplified interaction and make the game more accessible if necessary. Um, and I feel like this part kind of took quite a bit of time and a bit of back and forth. Um, the cards themselves, there are a hundred in the pack. I'm just showing you a few here. Don't know if you can see. Um, and as you can see on the screen, I've kind of included some of my earlier hand-drawn illustrations so before the cards became to be what I envisioned them to be and there was a point where they were matching as pairs um, so you know the white matched with the black based on proverb to meaning but but I changed this idea and I thought I wanted to add more value so I created all the cards to be proverb um, cards instead and um, you know, to reflect every country on the continent. And instead, I thought I could easily highlight the meanings and the origins of these proverbs in a booklet or on the card. Um, there was also the dice component, um, which initially uh, the pillars that I had mentioned previously were on the cards, as you can see on the white card. Um, but I changed this because I was quite inspired by a different game where the dice um, faces kind of prompted specific discussion. And um, 
Yeah, as I mentioned, these pillars kind of um, are used to broaden conversation and help people understand how the proverb can be applicable into everyday life. So again, I'm just showing in the screen a little bit of the um, of the dice. There was also um, a timer. Uh, and as I mentioned before, when initially playing the game, my uncle was a big storyteller. So I thought it was important to have an element uh, or a component that would kind of reel in the big storytellers, but also kind of prompt the quieter people to, to speak. Um, however, I find like you don't need to play with the timer and some people don't because they prefer a bit more of a free flowing conversation. I then looked at um, adding the booklet, which would give an overview of the game, the brand, the instructions, and most importantly, um, the proverb meanings um, and indicate what regions they were from. Um, as I mentioned before, there was no right or wrong with the game. Um, so I did title the, the booklet, which I have here, um, as the proverb meaning guide, um, because I... Personally, I thought, you know, wisdom is universal and um, proverbs are universal, but um, they can sometimes mean something different to different people, depending on your age, your background, your experience and where you are in life at a point in time. Um, but it doesn't take away um, the value that's added from it. So that's why I called it a proverb meaning guide. And then the box itself um, I really wanted the game to be compact um, and easy to travel with since I personally enjoy traveling. Um, so here's the game and um, the lid is behind me, sorry. Um, and I also wanted it to feel like a feature that could be, you know, set out in your home or uh, on the mantelpiece or something and would look nice in front of guests. So is why I've included the gold um, foil edge, for example. Um, just moving um, lastly on to a bit of the mechanics. Um, I, you know, I've talked about mechanics, but I, I do think it was a bit challenging trying to work this out. But to help overcome that, I did um, hold a lot of tester groups with my siblings, with my siblings' friends, with my own friends and other family members, just to see how um, things would work and also get people's feedback. Um, I think it, I also made, you know, handmade prototypes of, of the cards before they became the cards that I've just shown you um, by ordering like blank cards from Amazon and drawing on them um, and testing how they looked and felt and the mechanics of the game and as well as ordering a, a dice and a timer from Amazon. Um, and as I mentioned, with regards to mechanics, the um, the game really is to prompt meaningful conversation and you know to develop people's interpersonal skills and provide an education um encourage people to see value in in African oral traditions which is you know why for example the eldest goes first and I also wanted it to go in rounds so um it would give people that everyone the ability to um to contribute um, but the length of the arounds or contributions didn't necessarily need to be set. Hence, you know, you can use the timer or not. Um, and I thought this would add, you know, more meaning and depth to the convo conversations when, you know, when people pick a card and read out aloud and discuss or, you know, they roll a dice and, you know, just to encourage sharing of your own perspectives confidently, but also be more tolerant to hear other people's perspectives. Um, and, you know, there was also the voting element at the end of each round where people could play for points if they were a bit competitive. Um, and that was all based on if they um, explained their proverb meaning and interpretations um, successfully to the group. So that's based on the group decision. Um, with regards to the physical design of the card, um, I, I I really found this part quite exciting as it, you know, allowed me to be creative and quite artistic, um, but also required quite a bit of research. Um, I, you know, always knew that I wanted black and gold um, as my base colour. And, and as you can see from my PowerPoint <laughs> presentation, uh, 
like handmade illustrations and um I did a bit of research on the color meanings with regards to branding and I've you know got quite a few compliments on the look and feel of it and I worked closely with a friend who was a graphic designer who helped me with the logo and the design of um, the game and the cards and he was able to follow my direction and also give um, feedback on what went well or what didn't. When um, it came to the production, um, as I mentioned previously, I had sketched uh, the cards on PowerPoint and kind of made hand handmade prototypes um, to test the game before going into production. Um, but I also did quite a bit of research, um, like looking into articles on the internet, going into blogs and chat rooms, looking at YouTube to understand the process of what goes into game production because I don't have that background um, and looking into you know specifications on materials and average measurements and what lead times would be for production and shipping and you know how these factors might impact my production costs um, and I think with the production phase it you know, the pre and the production, it took the longest time um, as I didn't really want to rush anything. And I did encounter a few hiccups here and there, but I also wanted to make sure that what I was doing would come out well. Um, and I was also juggling, you know, the everyday life, working and studying, et cetera, which was quite challenging. But as I mentioned, I wasn't under any tight timings. So I could take my time to speak with suppliers and get their feedback and suggestions. Um, I was also self-funding. So I kind of had to be mindful of costs and I eventually built a budget and started tracking my costs, which I probably should have done earlier. And, um, you know, I, I was, however, encouraged not to take too much time to get uh, a product out, you know, because I could be quite a bit of a perfectionist at time. Um, I think the point was that, you know, it's most important to get something out so you can learn from it, uh, make iterations and learn from the improvements quickly. Um, and I felt that was also useful in me creating the handmade, you know, um, prototype um, before spending money on samples. Um, with regards to building my network, I felt this was helpful because I... Um, was able to draw on people and take advice from people on various aspects, whether it was to test things, create things, um, give me advice or teach me something. And one key person I reached out to was um, uh, had launched their own children's puzzle and uh, other children products. And he's still growing today. Um, very, very puzzled is his brand. And um he gave me a contact and he also gave me some advice regarding, you know, production and et cetera, which I used and was very helpful. So I would say and encourage people generally just to not be shy in asking people for help or direction because it could be, you know, very valuable and a turning point. Um, and then also with regards to network. As a small business, I think you naturally start to build a network of other small businesses who champion you and can give you insight into various aspects of the production process and, and the business as, as a whole. Um, as I mentioned, I had worked with a graphics designer and um, but I also use designers from Fiverr. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's heard of it to fill the gaps, probably so, but um, it, again, it was new to me, given design wasn't my background or isn't my background. Um, and, you know, with regards to the cards themselves, I learned quite a lot from suppliers and doing research, whether it was about card thickness in GSM or color codes and material types to get silk touch or the gold foil edges and necessary measurements and as I mentioned I'm not an expert but I found it quite useful just to make sure I recorded and saved everything so I could refer back to it even till today um, to help me put this presentation together for example. Um, I, I would say with regards to suppliers and samples um, this probably was one of the biggest challenges, not only because it was a new um, thing for me to do, but, you know, looking at comparing com 
production costs, whether it was in the UK, across Europe or Asia, and finding the right kind of material and availability, uh, you know, costs and dimensions was interesting to learn. And I did end up um, deciding to use a company that I found on Alibaba. And um, in total, I probably ordered about four to five samples from different companies, um, which also became quite costly um, and impacted my lead times. But I would say ordering those samples um, and going back and forth with those suppliers was a good opportunity for me to ensure there was a level of quality assurance and ensuring I got what I wanted and an element of version control through production. Um, which again, I documented and, you know, I have reference points to. So I guess throughout production, um, you know, I found, you know, clear communication and, and patience very key throughout this phase being a long phase. Um, so with the marketing, I, again, I, I think it was a very exciting stage and still is but also quite challenging as there are so many mediums to use. And again, I'm not a social media expert either. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, I wanted to make sure I was communicating effectively to my audience and targeted them. So on the page, um, you can see a leaflet that I created on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, like a snapshot from my Instagram, um, below is a picture of me at a market, um, a marketplace. And I'm also just going to show you a quick video um, to show you me. Yes. go back sorry um yeah so I would say um doing the research behind the marketing and you know figuring out the target audience and doing market research on what competitors were doing and as well as you know spending time on the brand development and the storytelling behind the brand was quite helpful and um also fed into my use of indirect and direct marketing so for indirect i use social media as my main tool um because you know it's quite good in gaining awareness especially for small businesses and it's an opportunity to reach your target audience and you know convert others um as well as the opportunity to draw people in with the storytelling of the brand etc um i guess the challenge here i found is that you have to be quite consistent and quite innovative um on developing content around your product and your brand and staying on trend with things and uh you know uh, there's always something new so I am on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and more recently on TikTok, but there is room for growth and improvement on all those platforms for myself. With content creation, um, I spent, you know, quite a lot of time creating my own content from using my iPhone. So whether that's the individual product shots that you saw on the previous slide and the lifestyle shots and also um, these campaign videos um, that I showed at the beginning and just now. Um, so um, and, you know, word of mouth is also quite useful, you know, encouraging others to post on their social media and, you know, recommend recommending to their friends and family if they buy the game or play the game. Um, with regards to direct marketing, uh, I think attending these marketplaces, as you've just seen, um, whether it's a Christmas market or a fair or, you know, whatever, was quite pivotal in gaining exposure for House of Talking Drums, the brand and the African proverb game, because um, you kind of get to 
and get more comfortable with uh, public speaking and, you know, talking with customers directly and, you know, getting that feedback. So it's an opportunity to practice your sales pitch and build confidence in yourself and your brand um, and an opportunity also to meet uh, other small businesses and network and learn from them. I have also created a website, which I'll show at, uh, I'll give you the, um, which I'll give you the, um, the, the website at the end. Um, and, uh, I found someone on Fiverr to, to help me produce that. Um, yeah. Um, using the graphics my friend had given me and my own photography and then there were I've also used you know forms of leafleting which I would share out at um, events and also paid for for ads on on social media so just heading on to the challenges uh, and nearly finished thanks for bearing with me um I would say, you know, as the proverb in the beginning that I showed, it it, it said um, a long journey starts with a first step. And, you know, this journey itself is not without any hurdles that I've had to jump over and challenges to face. But I feel like I've tried not to look at them as setbacks, but more as opportunities to learn and improve Um and you know, improve and make the brand and the product better. Um, I think, as I mentioned, one of the challenges was dealing with suppliers and samples, um, which proved challenging because of you know miscommunication, um, which you know ended up being a costly mistake at some point. Um, so I felt I felt like it's important to take my time. Um, and do my due diligence with regards to specifications and comparing what needs you need, um, but also being aware not to pre and preventing others from, you know, rushing you in the process um, and taking your own time. Um, uh, another challenge was, again, because it was self-funded, um, costs and keeping that afloat. Um, I think I would have benefited from probably, you know, establishing a budget a lot sooner and and also looking for opportunities like um, Kickstarter for funding. Um, however, I would say this being a challenge has also encouraged me to reach out to my networks, you know, friends to help me do the graphics design and such. And then, you know, also put the onus on myself to learn how to um you know, create a video campaign or do product shots and, you know, reach like maybe use Fiverr just for smaller things that were not as costly. Um, and all my profits have gone back into the business to avoid additional spending. Um, I'd say running a business in itself can also be quite challenging, um, like learning about tax and legalities and the setup um, of it in all just you know, kind of took quite a while, but it's good that there are so many resources online to learn from, from YouTube and blogs or reaching out to people, whether it's, you know, registering a business or, you know, someone recommended me uh, an accountant who was also another small business and, um, you know, learning on YouTube how to set up my inventory and automatic shipments from my, from my website. Um, so yeah, there is a lot of benefit in going out and building um, a network of other small businesses and people around you. And um, I would say another challenge was just, you know, keeping up with social media, as I mentioned on the marketing page and, you know, getting to grips with new tools and um, finding in innovative ways to promote the business um, and learning how to you know, keep the content engaging and understanding what's best to use. But again, it's a good opportunity to learn from others and see what other people are doing and what's trending and take risks to 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 improve the brand and, and attract more people. And lastly, I would say, and most importantly, the challenge of keeping consistent and motivated. Um, uh, whether that's me being, you know, growing a social media presence or generating sales, 
um, expanding the brand by networking or going to events such as this, um, whilst balancing the demands of everyday life and work um, can be quite challenging. So, you know, people have told me not to be too hard on myself and um, which is a good, a good thing just to, you know, share with anybody, advise anyone. Um, but it's also good to seek opportunities and seize those opportunities when they come and, you know, building breaks for rest to help keep the momentum so you're not overburning yourself at times as well. And I think most importantly, championing yourself is important. And, um, you know, ensuring that you have the right people around you to support you, which means a lot, but also knowing that sometimes the support from others may come and go and not taking it too personal um, and just remembering to keep yourself motivated and, you know, focus on the goal at hand. So lastly, um, and to round off is my next steps. Um, although I've made it this far in this journey, I kind of see myself at a new beginning, almost like a new chapter, as I have aspirations for the game and the brand to develop and to create more tools um, under the House of Talking Drums umbrella, um, you know, to promote African oral traditions and storytelling and bring people together. And this looks like expanding globally into new markets once I've done more here within the UK and that might be you know the US some key cities in the US next or other English speaking countries across the diaspora um, you know creating more products and tools as I mentioned under the house of talking drums and I have an idea of doing a, a children's version of the the game um, which would probably be more of an educational teaching tool and um, also you know taking more opportunities for exposure, you know, driving more awareness of the brand, going to trade shows and other events and, you know, building my network and community, whether it's small businesses or people with specific skill or people who are just able to advise, um, yeah, leveraging opportunities to be involved in things such as, you know, coming to speak with you guys here and, um, yeah. Lastly, I just wanted to leave a few tips because I know you're, some people are um, going to design their own board games um, and tips that I have found helpful, which was, you know, document everything. One, it will help remind you of your journey and keep you inspired. And then you also have things as a reference point. Um, ask for help. Um, don't be afraid to reach out for your network. Research. The Internet is your friend. Don't take things too personal. If other people can't see your vision, um, it's most important that you believe in it. And then also you have nothing to lose by embarking on this journey. So, yeah. Thank you all for listening. I hope I didn't take up too much time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amako. Yeah, it's really an interesting presentation. Well crafted, you know, game design. And I love how you've uh, provided detailed explanation of the different steps, you know, the design process, even though you're not getting the design code, but then providing and considering all those design processes and uh, the process and uh, even the marketing commercialization of the, the game. And it's really so detailed and it's so inspiring. Uh, I'm not sure if we have questions, uh, perhaps maybe we can have um, a couple of questions before we move to our next uh, speaker. Okay. After you. Uh, Theodore? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, thank you so much. It was really inspirational. Uh, it's not that much a question. Well, I have a question, uh, but uh, because I'm just ordering the cards and I don't, I want to know how fast they're going to reach me because I'm traveling <laughs> to another country. So. <laughs> So that's the uh, the most important question. Uh, but uh, before you answer me, I have to say that um, the, in a sense, it's, it was so great that you are here because uh, um, you, in my eyes, you are the archetypical designer that we want to create within this new bachelor in design degree. So you were driven by values. You were driven with the, uh, creating a culture, creating the, these cultural conversations. You are driven with with all these uh, notions that you, all these ideas that you had, 
And then you brought so many different design domains together, essentially disciplines together. You were operating. You say, well, I, I asked graphic designer. I had friends to work, uh, help me with marketing. So a sense, essentially, you coordinating a lot of design activity that are happening around different domains, and that is exactly what we're trying to do with BDES. And it's so difficult to to explain it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but you your story it was so powerful that i really uh, like to tell that story again and again um, in the london design festival maybe and uh, i also on linkedin i already asked you to connect maybe to you know to, to disseminate your work from there but also promote this idea of designer that you are mm -hmm. um and you, it was it was really great so but yes, how fast they're going to receive my cards? That's the most important thing. <laughs> the most important thing. Well, it could be um, with, within the week. So I can put it on next day delivery or, you know, a number of working days. So depending on yeah. where you're, you're living. Uh, yeah, if it... next Friday. I think oh, it might yeah. be all right. Oh, yeah, yeah, you'll be yeah, fine. You'll I'll get to in London then. as well. So it's yeah. really okay. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm definitely open, open to other opportunities to speak and share the game and, you know, um promote it to others so i i'll be accepting your linkedin uh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah, you. yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, um I'm, I'm going to follow up theo's comment um amazing presentation and you packed a lot of things there so that i think you know <laughs> there's probably more um things to to think about and absorb but thinking about um i think i found really interesting the fact that you said you didn't start from a design background so you studied at soas um and obviously you know you <laughs> you you are like um a very good example of a designer um so i guess my question is um, you, you listed a lot of things that someone needs to think about. Um, sort of thinking back, um, what do you think would be like the top um, abilities or competencies that you think were important um, allowing you to, to take this journey? Um, I, I don't know, yeah? Um, I think I understand that you're saying within because I don't have a design background, what were the key driving forces that um helped me co create this, if that's what okay. I'm understanding. Yeah, yeah. Um I would say one, the values and passion behind the idea. So I think if I didn't have a passion for African proverbs and see the value in it and then also just generally enjoy having conversations at a deeper level with people um, naturally you know within my own time with friends and family um, and doing therapy I think you know I think that was key I also think my uh, so I mentioned I did international studies and diplomacy at SOAS but for as a master's but as my undergrad I did his, a history degree at Brunel and I think my research background was very useful because it encouraged me to not give up and look at the smaller details like you see the overarching things but maybe look at the more minuscule things that might be relevant to you know building a brand or marketing a brand or um, producing something and um, honestly I guess as well as I mentioned I didn't have anything to lose really um, I, I wasn't shouting about it to anyone or um, it wasn't like I would lose face or I mean if this idea worked it worked if it if it didn't it didn't I would have at least something to play at home with my friends and family. Um, and I think because of that, it has meant that I've gained maybe probably more confidence through people's um, compliments and when they also see the value in it, which is also encouraging to me. But 
because I myself initially didn't think I had anything to lose it was almost like why not let me just give it a go and be tenacious with it and every step there was further encouragement from yeah the environment yeah that's amazing uh yeah <laughs> that's really amazing thank you Thank you. Uh, it it really it's really helpful for us as well um, as we are developing uh, the qualification. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Amakwa, and um, yeah, I hope you will still be able to hang around um, with us a little bit after the second of, um, speaker. We will still have maybe a short time for anybody who wants to ask any question or maybe can interact. Okay. Yeah, I'll stay. Uh, I put the link on the of your website on on the chat. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so we have the link, the link to uh, the link to your website on on the, yeah, the chat. Yeah, I put the I put the I put the link your website. There was a strange noises actually as I was talking, like <laughs> I was little voices. But uh, yes, I put the the website and uh, yeah. Um, can I quickly oh. ask the follow up Katerina's question? Uh, because what uh, in in terms of your skills, uh, uh, because that was quite. I mean, I did. I I recognize what you said. This kind of it felt like you started with this small personal thing, and that was growing, 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 and and that's a strategy. It's in essentially a strategy of how you cope with this thing. So it's and it's a skill in one sense. Uh, but the uh, the other impressive thing is that I could see that you you start bringing together very different things. Yeah, I mean the 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 logo, the the process, the pro the the, uh, the testing, the experimentation, the prototyping. So mm -hmm. you were you were doing so many different things that to some extent uh, a lot of designers do, but you were doing it in a in a in a you you brought all this together. You organize it and you make it happen. And I'm trying to explain how you already had these skills there. Uh, and um, yeah, if you have, if you can reflect a little bit on that, I mean, uh, let's how did, say yeah. maybe, um, maybe maybe more naturally, I'm a bit of an organizer, um, mm. and an overthinker when you know putting thoughts and things together. So, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a program manager at the British Council at the moment. And mm. at the same time, I work on some projects um, and have done a bit of, you know, project work and operational work in, in my past. So I think maybe I'm also a natural organiser and I enjoy piecing things together. And so having... I think about even doing my master's or doing dissertations in my mind, just seeing all the different um, points of information and fitting them together um, mm. in, in organizing them in a, in a useful way and then reducing it, reducing it, but then also me being able to have an overarching, but then with the, you know, the subsections yeah. Yeah. underneath. Um, and I think research supports that. Uh, my ability to research, I should say. Yeah, um, yeah I recognize that. Uh, sorry for these sort of questions, but it is because of the context. It was so. Uh, I, I, I wanted to ask this question, but we will. I'll, I bought the, the the game, and we will play it in a Greek context in Greece. Okay. Uh, uh, so that might be an interesting. Uh, what Katerina was saying about cultural exchange, because that I guess a lot of this will provoke a lot of interest in terms. Oh, we have a similar proverb, or we have very different from proverb, yes. or what that could mean in it uh, and so that um so yeah so maybe we'll follow up this during the summer uh mm -hmm. <laughs> what will happen with this game i will say sorry quickly that at markets i have found that you know people from other backgrounds and even different african countries say oh we have a similar saying or it's said like this and what i say is you know wisdom is universal so there is still the meaning you'll get and which is why it's it's nice to to play it with a d diverse group of people because what you'll gain at one point in life, you'll gain at a different point in life with regards to the proverb. And if you're from this background, you might look at it this perspective or a different perspective, but then you learn off each other by the sharing throughout the game. So 
you know, nothing is wasted, everything is gained. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. I'm sure uh, Theo will link up with you later on to, to, to continue the discussion. So because of our time, Bob, uh, let's move on to the, the next uh, speaker, Jonathan Baldwin, who is uh, a service design manager at Police Scotland. And uh, we will be discussing, we will be talking, sorry, oh, the background noise. <laughs> We'll be talking to us today about service design. Over to you, Jonathan. Sadly, we were not allowed to record Jonathan's uh, talk, but if you decide to study with us on T190, it is very likely that you will hear more about his service design work. So register, sign up and come study with us design practices. <laughs>